I got a lot of really interesting comments on my recent videos and I wanted to talk about many of those. However, they usually uh, do not justify making an entire video. So what I'm going to do today is another question and answer video. You had comments, you had questions. I'm trying to give an answer. And today I'm actually also going to disagree with some of you. So controversy. Stay tuned. But first of all, hello everybody, in case you're new here, my name is Michael Wagner. I'm a digital media educator with more than 30 years of experience in higher education. And on this channel, I talk about digital media, game design and spatial audio. Today about a couple of very interesting comments. If any of those topics interest you, I invite you to subscribe or join our Discord community. In that link is in the description below, or there's also a QR code here somewhere. And with that being said, let's get to our first question. And that was on a video where I showed you how to extract 7.1.4 audio out of Adobe Atmos music file with the uh, Apple Music application. And uh, if you want to know how we did that, I'm going to leave links to these videos in the description below here. I'm not going to go about the details, but the question was, does this method also work for Adobe Atmos tracks in video files? And the answer to the question is yes, it does, as long as you're using the Apple streaming service. So this does not work with Netflix, or Amazon, at least not to my knowledge, at least not now, but it does work with Apple TV, for example. And in order to show you that it actually works, what I've done here is I've opened up Apple TV on my Mac and I've also opened up the loopback device. For those of you who haven't seen that video, the loopback device was used in order to trick the Mac into believing that we have a 7.1.4 speaker layout attached to the Mac. So this loopback device is set as our main output output device and as soon as I do that the, uh, the, the, the Mac actually thinks that there is a 7.1.4 speaker layout connected. So if I'm now playing that, uh, that video here on Apple TV, I'm actually getting a full 7.1.4 output and I can then essentially use that in order to extract the audio out of uh, that uh, video that essentially uses Dolby Atmos. There's one additional thing I wanted to point out and that is something that a couple of you have actually contacted me about and that is if you go into the audio device settings in order to select the speaker configuration that you want to use. In the video I had the option of selecting a 9.1.6 Atmos surround setup. Now that option never really worked so if we selected it it didn't really kind of address uh, the full 16 speakers but it was there and a couple of you have pointed out that they no longer see that option and the reason for that is that Apple actually removed that option in the latest macOS update. So if you're working with the latest macOS version you're no longer having that option which once again doesn't make a whole lot of difference because it never really worked anyway. In the video I had a previous version of macOS and there it was still included. On my video about the Skydust presets, Earworm Candy, I hope I pronounced that correctly, said Arnold Schwarzenegger wants you to buy Skydust. And then Rich7714 followed up with some of the words he said were spot on, just like Arnie. Now this is a comment that I get quite often, I think I already talked about it in a previous video. It is true that I grew up in an area that is about one hour away from where Arnie grew up, so it makes sense that our accents sound similar. However, I do have to point out that for the trained Austrian ear, his accent is completely different to mine. The reason for that is that he is coming from an area where they have a very localized way of speaking. So this is very, very specific to that particular area where, that, where he comes from. And, uh, and so kind of for us, or for my ears, kind of he talks completely differently, but I do understand that for the untrained ear, for the English speaker, they sound pretty much the same. I've started to take this as a compliment. Arne is a great guy, has accomplished a lot of things. And quite frankly, it also makes my life easier because people have started to learn how to listen to the way he speaks. And that also makes it easier for them to understand me, which is cool. And I also need to point out that Arnie has been in the United States for more than half of a century. So apparently this accent is very difficult to get rid of. So I don't even have to try. As a side note, when I started teaching in the United States, I always ended my lecture with the words, I'll be back. And my students really got a kick out of that. Unfortunately, the students of today no longer really understand that reference. So I'm no longer using it, which is, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Lovely how you pronounce hate speakers as hate speakers. Well, that's what they are, aren't they? I know a lot of people who hate the idea of having speakers on their ceilings, so I think that's completely appropriate. On a more serious note, um, PRJD9 wrote, uh, I know it's not my business, but I would prefer to listen to a video about spatial audio in a non-perfect headphone setting, but still in binaural so that I could appreciate it in its basic form. 
Now, there are really two reasons why I never use binaural audio in my videos. And the first one is an obvious one. Not everybody is listening to my videos on headphones. Uh, and if you're not using headphones, then binaural audio is actually detrimental to the listening experience. It actually makes things worse. So stereo is simply the safer option. The second reason is that I don't really like the idea of promoting the concept that binaural audio is the ultimate way of listening to spatial audio, because quite frankly, it isn't. If you want to listen to spatial audio, the best experience that you get is from a fully immersive speaker layout, a fully immersive speaker system. And if you don't have that, the second best option is head-tracked binaural audio, so essentially headphones with a head track on top of it. But using static binaural audio doesn't really give you a whole lot of advantage. Yes, it's a little bit more three-dimensional, but it doesn't really tell you a whole lot about where exactly all the sounds are coming from. So it's a little bit of a gimmick, to be perfectly honest. So my strong recommendation is to always test everything yourself. Download the software, test out the presets, play around with it, um, test them out in your particular listening environment. And if you're used to listen to spatial audio with static binaural rendering, by all means do that, but I'm a little bit reluctant to actually pipe that through YouTube because I think it gives the wrong impression about what binaural audio actually can do. Now I do need to point out that the video about the Skydust presets was not a particularly good video that has a reason actually. I had originally planned to release a different video that day, that was the video about the Fiedler Audio Dolby Atmos Composer, but that got delayed for some reason. And so I needed a quick video. I needed to make a very quick video in order to replace that. And I decided to do one about the Skydust presets because that was something that I could put together very, very quickly. But it ended up being actually one of my worst videos. So if you didn't like that video, I completely agree. It was not a good one. The next comments are really interesting ones and they were made on my video about binaural mixes not being immersive. Um, the first one comes from DDS Lab and here she writes, since Atmos as well as binaural are both based on oralization processes, yes, binaural is immersive. Now I do respect your opinion, but I have to say that I completely and passionately disagree. And that has a very particular reason, and that is that we sometimes confuse a technology with an experience. When we're talking about something being immersive, we're talking about a human experience. When we're talking about binaural audio, we're talking about a technology. And we're living in an age where we sometimes confuse one with the other. If we have a technology, we automatically associate an experience with it. But this is not necessarily the case. Yes, binaural audio allows you to render audio in a way that is consistent with the way we would normally hear audio in a three-dimensional environment. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that it creates an immersive experience. In order to create an immersive experience, it needs a little bit more than just the technology itself. It needs somebody who can actually use the technology in the best way possible. And my point was that it doesn't make any difference if you're using stereo or binaural. If you are a bad producer that cannot produce immersive audio, you will not be able to produce immersive audio regardless of the technology that you're using. And vice versa, if you're actually really good at what you're doing, even if you're only working with stereo, you can create immersive experiences with stereo alone. So banal audio is not a, a safe entry point to creating immersive audio. It's not that somebody who has no experience or has no concept about how to create immersive audio can simply kind of render everything in binaural and then suddenly it becomes immersive. This is not the case. It takes an experienced engineer to create immersive audio and that is no different if it's stereo or binaural. Uh, the technology has very little influence on what the outcome actually is. Danny Kirsch goes into a similar direction. He writes, I respectfully disagree that stereo sounds better than binaural. A good binaural mix sounds far superior than stereo. Well, first of all, I don't think I said that stereo sounds better than binaural. At least I don't think I did. This is, once again, the same thing that I just said, uh, a technology question as opposed to an experience question. Um, the technology itself does not guarantee that one sounds better than the other. It's sort of what you do with it that makes the difference. And it is true that a good binaural mix can sound good, but um, the question is, does a good binaural mix sound better than a good stereo mix? And I'm honestly not that sure, because quite frankly, it depends a lot on what you actually want to achieve with it. Yes, a good banal mix gives you a three-dimensional impression, but maybe that's not what you want to do. Maybe you want to do something that goes beyond what normal three-dimensional hearing can accomplish. Maybe you actually kind of would like to do something that's a little bit more creative, that plays around with three-dimensionality in a way that a banal mix cannot do. And uh, for that, a stereo mix might be better. So a very experienced 
a stereo mix engineer might be better to create something that has more value than a binaural mix. But once again, it's a question of the technology as opposed to the what you do with it. Saying that stereo is better than binaural does not make any more sense than saying that binaural is better than stereo. They're both technologies and it's the use of those technologies that makes one better than the other. And, uh, and not the technology itself. Here's an interesting one from user EDWABR123. I'm sorry if I butchered your username, but I couldn't figure out a way how to pronounce it. Uh, I'm wondering about intellectual property protection when using Dolby Atmos. Isn't that in that format you basically expose individual unmixed tracks along with the arrangement information? And the question is, uh, by doing that, don't you allow other people to simply copy your arrangement? And that's actually an interesting one because it is true that in the Dolby Atmos master file you have the individual objects which are technically the tracks and then you have the panning information. So you actually expose how the individual objects are panned in your three-dimensional environment and somebody could actually use that information in order to uh, recreate something. I'm just not completely sure if that is an, a problem with respect to intellectual property. Uh, because first of all, when this is distributed through streaming services, for example, it is encoded in a way where you cannot reproduce the the way it was originally kind of mixed or the way it was originally panned. This is only visible in the Dolby Atmos master files and master files are generally not distributed. And the second thing is I'm not quite sure if there's a lot of really useful information in there. Um, it essentially, yes, it tells you how you pan your objects, but that's pretty much it. Um, why would that be an issue? Um, with the technology we have today, we can, for example, um, unmix certain tracks anyway. So having that exposed doesn't really kind of create any more problems that we already have. But I did find this a very interesting comment because it opens up a whole lot of questions and I would really be interested to hear your opinion. So if you have any opinions about that subject, leave a comment in the comment section below. Is it the problem that you, when you're creating Dolby Atmos master files, that you're actually exposing the panning information of your individual tracks? Do you think that is an issue? Does this infringe on your copyright? Or is there a possibility that somebody could infringe on your copyright by utilizing that information? Uh, I'm honestly torn. I don't think it's an issue, but you know, kind of, I would like to hear your opinion. QFX Music is a regular commenter on my videos, and I think I mentioned him or her in pretty much any question and answer video that I ever created, and uh, this one is no difference. QFX Music writes, um, still not convinced that head tracking is great for mixing in Atmos, uh, but I will give it a go. Now, it is important to recognize that head tracking is a workaround. Um, there is no question that if you have a really good 7.1.4 Atmos Studio, you're not going to get even close to that with head tracking. However, many of us don't really have access to that. We might not have the money to buy a full Dolby Atmos setup. We might not have the space to actually kind of create a full Atmos studio. We might be on the road a lot. We might kind of do our music in a cafe somewhere by slurping a latte. Uh, and if you are in a situation like that, then head tracking is the only alternative that you have. So I don't think it is a replacement for a full Atmos setup. That is absolutely not the case. If you have an Atmos studio, use that obviously. Uh, but it is sort of the second best option. Um, and uh, the other thing that I would say is that um, it does make sense to kind of at least monitor your productions with uh, head tracking because that is the way people listen to it. If you're using an iPhone and AirPods, that is head tracked uh, surround sound. Um, so if you want to get the experience that somebody is getting uh, by listening to your audio on a, an iPhone or any other device, um, then you probably have to at least once uh, kind of listen to it with head tracking in order to understand how that actually translates into a system that is based on head tracking. But that once again doesn't mean that this really replaces a Dolby Atmos Studio. Uh, if you have a 7.1.4 Studio, that will always be the better solution because that will always give you the better audio. The next comments were on my review of the HyperX Cloud OBS, which were headphones that have an included head tracker, a Waves and X head tracker actually. And a couple of you mentioned that uh, they had the yoke break on their headphones and they were not particularly happy with those headphones. The Burnt Waffle, for example, writes, uh, these are awful, I got a pair and the swivel headset started to have cracks appear in the plastic. And this is a problem that actually many pointed out. And I have to say, and I said that in my review, that these were really tight. They had a high clamping force. 
And uh, I can see that actually becoming an issue, uh, especially if you have a large head, that essentially there's a lot of force on those and they will eventually break. I had uh, similar things happen to me with other headphones. I have a very large head, but I have to say that I never had an issue with those particular headphones. And uh, I didn't have the HyperX very long, but I had the previous model, the Odyssey Mobius for quite some time, and they didn't have any issues. Now, it could be that the quality of the production of the HyperX is worse than the original Odyssey. That's very possible. But I just wanted to point out that, yes, uh, you know, kind of with headphones of that nature, if you have a large head, sometimes they break. Once again, happened to me with other headphones, not with these ones, but just so that you're aware. These are headphones that are very, very tight. And if you have a large head, that might become an issue. On the same video, the GD Choker pointed out that the best way to monitor immersive audio with headphones is the Smith Realizer E16. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Smith Realizer E16 is a standalone unit, so it's a physical device that you can use in order to virtualize a Dolby Atmos Studio environment. And one of the things that it does is that you can connect your headphones and then use the head tracking that comes with that device in order to get head tracked by neural audio in the best quality possible. Now, many people have reached out to me telling me that this is really the best way to monitor Dolby Atmos with headphones. However, I've not been able to test that. Uh, the device itself is very, very expensive and uh, I don't know anybody who has one, at least not in my immediate area. I've reached out to Smith Research to see if I could get a review unit, uh, but as it turns out, these units are built to order. So if you order one, they actually build it so they don't have anything on stock. Um, but they said that they might be able to send me one. So if they are able to send me one, I'm definitely going to review them on this channel. And I would be really interested to learn how that actually works and how good they are, because I, once again, I am only hearing good things about them. A quick one on my video about uh, Dolby Atmos and Digital Performer. Uh, Brian Ralston 344 wrote, SMPTE timecode can be exported from Digital Performer easily by using Moto's own SMPTE C plugin. It's a free stock plugin already included in Digital Performer. Now, for those of you who haven't seen that video, what Brian is referring to is the fact that we ran into an issue with the Dolby LTC timecode plugin. Digital Performer would not recognize that plugin, so we couldn't really use that. And we needed to find a workaround, and that workaround was done in a couple of different ways. And one way was, for example, to use an external plugin in order to create the SMPTE timecode. Now, I'm not a regular user. However, I did search if... Uh, Digital Performer had such a timecode included in their stock plugins, but for some reason I didn't find it. And as it turns out, I did not look close enough. So thank you, Brian, for pointing it out. There's actually a timecode plugin that Digital Performer has, so you don't need to go out and purchase the external plugin. You can simply use the one that comes with Digital Performer. And the final comment was made on a video about Hornet Thumb, and uh, it touches a topic that annoys me quite a bit. John Israel... 5183 writes, nothing works on a Mac. I'm never going from Windows to a Mac. Lol, done. I'm hearing all kinds of plugin disasters on the Mac. It seems like 30 to 40% of plugins have a problem on the Mac. Now, the reason this really annoys me so much is because this is something that I actually see quite often these days, and that is the need of people to express their opinions based on other opinions and not based on their own experiences. Um, and uh, this is also something that, by the way, DMS, which is one of the reviewers on the headphone show, mentioned in the previous videos or complained about in the previous videos, where he said that sometimes he gets annoyed by people kind of saying that one headphone is better than the other without even having tried the other headphone, just based on some opinion that they get from somewhere. If you have never worked on a Mac, if you have no experience on a Mac, why do you know that? That is true what you're saying. Where do you get the data from, quite frankly? Uh, the 30 to 40 percent, this is not the experience that I or probably anybody else has. It's just not true. Windows and Mac are two operating systems that both have their advantages and disadvantages. I use both simultaneously. I will use a Mac whenever it's more appropriate to use a Mac, and I will use Windows whenever it's more appropriate to use Windows. On this channel, you will sometimes see me use a Windows system. You will sometimes see me use a Mac system. I usually swap between those systems multiple times a day. I might start a project on the Mac and then kind of move it over to Windows or the other way around. I might do that multiple times a day. And I have to honestly say that um, I have about as many issues on Windows as I have on the Mac. There's no difference there. Um, Sometimes the Mac is better, sometimes the Windows is better. Now, I don't want to give the wrong impression. I do appreciate John Israel's comment, and uh, you're more than welcome to express your opinion. There's nothing wrong with that, but I just wanted to point out that your opinion is wrong. 
But I would really like to hear everybody else's opinion on the topic. Are you a Windows user? Are you a Mac user? What's your preference? What's your experience? Would you like me to make more videos that are Windows centric or more videos that are Mac centric? Let me know in the comment section below and I will try my best to satisfy your cravings. And with that being said, see you at the next video.